question. Resuming debate, the honorable member from Deneste, Mississippi, Mississippi, Churchill River. Let me help you with that, Mr. Speaker. It's does nothing Mississippi Churchill River. Before I, before I get into my comments today, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's always a pleasure to stand up and, and, and speak on behalf of the people that I serve. But one of the things that we don't do in this place is recognize the people that serve us behind the scenes. And I want to take a minute today to acknowledge my team who work tirelessly without recognition often to serve both the people in this House, members of Parliament like myself, but also the people that we represent, in my case specifically from Northern Saskatchewan. So I want to take a minute to recognize Lene and Emily who work with me here in Ottawa and Dene, uh, Dion Hunter and Cindy back in the riding and just uh, and make sure they know they, that, that they're appreciated for the work they do in serving the people that we get to serve. <laughs> Speaker, with that comment out of the way, let's, let's talk about Bill C-38 for a few minutes. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, that my colleague has presented to me to, to speak on this very important bill. Bill C-38 is an act that amends the Indian Act to address four separate matters, which we have already heard from, from the member speaking, but I'm, I'm going to hit on these just for a few minutes. First, it addresses the gender and equity issues as a result of enfranchisement. I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in a few minutes, and we've already heard as well that it addresses this issue of natal band reaffiliation, which, um, if passed this legislation, would allow women to reaffiliate with their natal band or the band they came from before having been forced to change to their husband's band if they were married before 1985. Um, we've heard about the opportunity through application to deregister from the Indian Registry, and there's a number of reasons why people might want to do that, and, and I'm not going to get into the details of that. And finally, we've heard the conversation already today around replacing offensive and outdated language so that no individual under the Act is referred to using any kind of discriminatory or offensive language. So that, I, I think we would say, is a very good thing. As has been mentioned as well, Bill C-38 is a continuation of a series of fixes. Fixes that began in, in 1985 under Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, some fixes that carried on in 2011 under Prime Minister Harper, and finally Bill S-3 that took from 2017 to 2019 um, through the Senate bill to, to make some progress on this. Each of these pieces of legislation address various matters of gender-based discrimination in the Act. I think while it's important to, to note that we support amendments to ensure that no federal legislation, legislation, including the Indian Act, has any discriminatory components to it, we must recognize that these amendments are just that, changes to existing legislation that support the maintenance of the status quo, a status quo that perpetuates control over First Nations people across our country. We cannot simply reverse the damages that these outdated laws have had, but what we can do is we can move forward in support of First Nations people on their journey to self-determination. Conservatives seek to ensure that we are making positive strides towards truth and reconciliation, and we know how important it is to, to hold open and honest discussions in doing so. Since I only have 10 minutes here, Mr. Speaker, I want to, I want to spend some time talking about enfranchisement. We, we've, we've done a bit of that already, but I want to flesh it out a little bit as well. For those who may not be familiar with the term, enfranchisement was a policy prior to 1985 that terminated an individual's right to be considered First Nations or have status under the Indian Act. As the Parliamentary Secretary and my colleague from Kenora have already identified, this could be done voluntarily, and, and, and each of them used the, the quote voluntarily, or it could be done involuntarily. When we think of involuntary registration, as been, has been mentioned, it could be because they received a university degree, or because they joined the medical or legal profession, or they married a non-Indian man, or became a priest or a minister. Under the voluntary components, um, we've heard as well that there's a number of reasons why that could happen. And, and again, when we use the term voluntary in this case, it doesn't seem like it was really a free will but it was, it was forced by other factors. Um, some, as I've been, I've been identified, gave up their status for the sole purpose of preventing their children from having to attend residential schools. World War II veterans voluntarily enfranchised to obtain the same essential benefits that other non-status veterans were provided. And some did so just so they could vote, so they had the right to vote. Mr. Speaker, if we look at these examples of voluntary enfranchisement, 
it doesn't really seem that it was a personal choice, but maybe more a sacrifice of rights or something that they were forced into to protect members of their family or others. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-38 seeks to address some remaining gender-based inequities that were a result of this unequal reinstatement of status in 1985. In short, women who enfranchised were, and were later reinstated were placed in a different category than men in the same circumstances. Because of this, First Nations women could not pass down status or rights to the same number of generations as First Nations men could. And this is something that this bill addresses to affect. And it, you know, it has a ripple effect because it affects the descendants of these people as well. I would actually like to encourage members of the House to go out and talk to people. Talk to people and hear their stories. We've heard a couple already today. But talk to the, the people who have been affected by enfranchisement. And I've heard many of these and I'm going to share one quickly. My team and I met with a Professor Carl Hurl. He's a member of the Garden River First Nation, a professor in Canadian Indigenous Studies. His personal experience with enfranchisement is not unfamiliar to many others. His mother and many other women in their community were targeted and coerced by an Indian agent to voluntarily enfranchise. This resulted in an unfair exclusion of their rights and of those of her descendants. To access his child's rights, Professor Hurl had no other choice but to pursue legal action, which came at a hefty cost both in time and resources, an option that many people don't have. This case highlights how the Indian Act gatekeepers have historically been and continue to be much of the problem. Mr. Speaker, it is little wonder why First Nations people in Canada feel that there's this Ottawa-led system that feels broken and we need to fix it. I believe we need to acknowledge despite amending the Act, there still needs to be a change in how First Nations issues are approached. This means acknowledging the failure in the cumbersome bureaucracy that is meant to support First Nations, but instead often creates significant barriers. The population of my riding, Mr. Speaker, is over 70% Indigenous, and my team deals with endless frustrations of individuals trying to either access their right to status, respond to other requests of maybe financial nature, or even access appropriate health services. Our office has been dealing with one individual who has been denied status time and time again. But the bigger issue is not the denial of status. The bigger issue is that this individual has been given a variety of excuses for the denial that contrast with their family story where other members of the family have been granted status under the same circumstances. It seems as though as this case has been passed around the department without a care or concern for the provision of an on, on, honest answer, and that's unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. In one of the calls with my office, this gentleman finally expressed his frustration and disappointment that he's going to give up because he believes he's going to die before this ever gets resolved. That's, that's, very, that's a very sad story, Mr. Speaker. What this story tells us is that we cannot accept simple amendments to the Indian Act as a means to an end. We can reshape the tool as many times as we like, but if we don't fix the mechanism, there will never be a fix to the problem. Our team is, con our conservative team is determined to address this problem. In fact, we are proposing steps to do that, and my friend from Kenora has already addressed one of those in relation to the, the leader proposing the First Nations resource charge and our, our plan for that. The goal of the federal government should be working with Indigenous leadership to put control of their communities back into their hands. While the hope for Bill C-38 is to, to address this in, 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 to some degree and to respond to a constitutional challenge on, on, on enfranchisement, it is merely a small step on a long journey to, to self-determination. We have a lot of work to do, and as Canada moves forward on eliminating the Indian Act, the Ottawa knows best mentality has got to go. Mr. Speaker, it is imperative that we recognize the rights and the freedoms of First Nations people across our country. They know what's good for them. They know what needs to be done. They've already taken many of the steps necessary by investing in projects and businesses and creating prosperity and employment. They're focused on increasing capacity and they're generating opportunities that will pay dividends for generations to come. It is important that the government no longer stand in their way and that we ensure that First Nations are the decision makers controlling their own destiny. We recognize that this is the only way forward, and although it will have its challenges, Conservatives are not afraid of a challenge. Mr. Speaker, in closing, let me simply say, under the leadership of a Conservative government, I am very hopeful for the future of our First Nations people across this country, and I am personally very eager to see meaningful change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.